Good day, brothers and sisters, and welcome once again to the CMI School of Christ. And we're going to go ahead and continue with our class, The Great Mercy of God. And, well, <laughs> I haven't had a class, as you very well may know, uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, I finally figured out what was uh, messing with my stomach. Unfortunately, I found out a little too late. Uh, but I found out, got rid of it. It was, it was a drink mix that just was really... Th- really throwing my whole system out of whack and for a loop. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, So I got rid of that, but then the next week I got a cold. So thankfully I am over the cold, and the Lord willing, I am on the upward mend of everything. <laughs> but anyway, that's why I haven't had a class in a couple of weeks. And uh, But we're just going to uh, continue here with, with where we've been. Uh, in Genesis chapter 16, and I think, I think if the Lord wills, we'll go ahead and introduce uh, the term Ishmael during this class. I, th- I think we may get to it. We probably will get to it. But in, in just going over some notes, uh, things that I've jotted down, things that I've you know, uh, read and looked at in different references, I wanted to make mention of, of a commentary that I was reading, and I think I, I was actually reading this maybe like three, four weeks ago, and I'm not sure if I shared it or not, but when I, when I was reading through some of my notes, I saw it and, and it just really struck my attention. I mean, the Lord really grabbed my attention with it, and well, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's see. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Just the, excuse me, the passage. And I want us to really consider something in just a second. Oops. Wrong chapter. Okay, that's right. It's in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 16, which I start with verse 4 in my notes, but it's actually verse 3. And I'll just go ahead and read it. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. And gave her to gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And I was just thinking about this. This is Abram after ten years of serving the purpose of the Lord in his generation. Remember when we when we when we consider the journey of Abram and the call of Abram, especially the call where the Lord says, Get thee out from and come unto a land that, very specifically, that I will show thee. And we found, in classes back, and I think it's uh, Genesis chapter 12, we found that when Abram finally comes to this land, that what the Lord indeed does is make himself known to Abram. The Lord himself shows himself to be present in the land. And from that moment onward, we've seen with the journey of Abram that that is literally what it is all about. Abram continues journeying. As long as Abram is journeying in the land, he discovers the Lord who is ever present in the land. Now, after 10 years... You would think that after 10 years of serving the purpose of the Lord in his generation, you would think that to some degree it would have been established in his heart, this is what it's all about. This is why the Lord called me in the first place, to discover him, to behold him, to know him. Because remember, 
as we've been looking at it with the journey of Abram, the moment, the very moment that the God of glory appears into Abram, that very moment, to me as I've seen it, it is as though the soul receives salvation. The soul receives the glory of God because the glory of God appeared unto Abraham. Remember? Stephen hits it right on the head. Okay? And I'm, that's Acts chapter 7. Like verses 1 through 4, somewhere in there, 5 maybe. Uh, but the whole issue for the Lord appearing was so that Abram could now discover him. All right. Now, if you think of the word discover, and I'm not, I'm not playing with words, please, please understand. If you think of the word discover, it's usually a person being ignorant or unaware, unaware of what is present. I remember uh, as, as, as a kid, I think I was like in fourth or fifth grade, I wanted to be an archaeologist. I loved, I loved learning about things of the past, and I wanted to discover hidden treasures and hidden this and things that people hadn't seen or known about, okay? Now, the whole issue with that is basically this. Oh, I'll just make this comment, this carnal comment, terrible, but that was actually before the Indiana Jones series came out, believe it or not. Um, but anyway, back, back to my example. It is built in us of God. It's built into our soul to discover. And once again, what, what, dis, what discovering something means, it doesn't mean that at that moment when they see it, then it's there or then it's real. No, no, no. What it means is this. It has been, whatever it is, whatever the object is, it has been there this whole entire time hidden from the sight of man. Therefore, man could not declare it. Man could not speak of it. Man was completely ignorant of what was present. <clears throat> so, once again with the journey of Abram, I'm looking at it as like the journey of a soul, the journey of the heart, okay? Once the God of glory appears, that soul is born again. At that very moment, the soul has been brought by the Spirit of God unto reality because reality, who is Christ himself, has appeared in the soul. All right? The heart, on the other hand, must now be brought in knowledge unto where the soul has already been brought in reality, okay? Now, how can a soul discover the ever-living God except the ever-living God be present in that soul? That's why we read, and the God of glory appeared. Therein is the beginning. The God of glory appeared. Now the God of glory is ever-present in the soul where he has appeared. We call this new birth. There, yes, you must be born again. If you're not born again, Christ is not present, then no matter how hard you try or how much you, you pray or cry out to God, you cannot discover God, you can, which basically means you cannot know God. Um, it's impossible. The only way God can be discovered is if he is present. I mean, even looking at, like, looking at the term. So anyway, so Abram, in type, he's born again. And the Lord, once again, reiterates his call now when he's in Haran. Because in his heart, he has not come, shall we say it this way, as the Apostle Paul said it, in Abram, while he dwells in Haran, his heart has not come in the unity of the faith, unto the knowledge of the Son of God. But see, that doesn't upset the Lord at all. That doesn't make God have to change course, have to change things, and now present plan B. No, no, no. 
No, the call remains the same. That's why the Lord reiterates the exact same call, get thee out from and come unto a land that I will show thee. Now, by the Spirit of God, Abram finally comes to the land. For us, it would be by the Spirit of God, our heart finally turns to the Lord. And when the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is removed and we discover him who has been present, ever present, since the moment of your birth. We discover him. The confession is like Jacob, my God, you are in this place and I knew it not. But that my knowing did not change the fact that you are in this place. My knowing did not change the fact that this indeed is the house of God, wherein God dwells. Do you, do you see what I mean? Our knowing doesn't determine reality. No, it doesn't. Our knowing is, listen, please do not misunderstand, our knowing is irrelevant in scope of the big picture. God's knowing is what matters. God knows his son. God knows where his son is present. Now, for us who are born again, to, to, how shall I put it? For us who are born again, to, I don't even know the words on how to communicate this. For us who are born again in our hearts to enter into the rest wherein God by his spirit hath brought our soul in reality, we must discover him, the rest that is present. Till then, till then, we're tossed to and fro, we're a bit unstable. Why? Well, for one, we have no clue who our life is. We still consider something that is not life to be our life. And yet the writer of Hebrews says this, consider Jesus, consider him. And even, even right here, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that's why I wanted to read verse three, is it 10 years of serving the purpose of the Lord in his generation, you would think that Abram was completely established in what it was all about. Well, man is man. And listen, God is God. So, uh, what happens in Genesis chapter 16 is that Man begins, and when I say man, I mean Ab Abram, Sarai, maybe even Hagar, I don't know. But man begins to consider something other than Christ the Son himself. To consider something other than the Son of the living God. Sarai begins to consider an heir. We need an heir. Because the Lord declared seed, heir, inheritance. And so then they all begin to consider an heir. And see, remember when, when, when the disciples, uh, one came to Jesus and said, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient. This is all we need. Just show us the Father. Okay, listen to this. He begins, the disciple, hey, this is, you know, it's spoken of in the scriptures, this father-son relationship. It's spoken of, I mean, Abram, a father. Okay, so here's a disciple coming to Jesus just show us the Father and it's sufficient. This is all we need, Lord. This will sustain us. And you listen to the response of the Lord. Have I been so long time with you 
And have you not known me? Jesus says this, He who has seen me has seen the Father. The issue once again, consider Jesus. Consider Christ. Well, yes, Lord, but, uh, you know, the scriptures, they, they testify of Christ. And see, I'm, thank, I'm thankful to the Lord that, you know, even with, with this situation with, with Abram, Sarai, and Hagar, even with, with them going, you know, considering something less than Christ, and therefore acting according to the mind of the flesh, the mind, the carnal, natural mind, and they produce, yes, Ishmael, that's to, that doesn't disrupt anything of God. Because God the Father, listen, and don't get upset with this, God the Father considers the Son. Remember what Jesus said, No man knoweth the Son but the Father. God doesn't know anything else. He knows His Son. He considers His Son and nothing less. And this, this is a good thing for us. This is a good thing. What shakes our little boat, right? What rocks our boat is the fact that we don't consider the Son. We consider something less. But see, God is at rest. And we have been brought into this rest. The thing is, our hearts are troubled as long as we consider something other than Christ himself, the Son of the living God. Here, they began considering something other than the Lord of what it's all about. Remember, the whole purpose, the whole thing, the, the predominant issue with the journey of Abram, discovering the Lord who is ever present in the land. In Abram discovering the Lord, all the rest. All the rest. Because, listen, all the rest is present in the person of the Lord. In, in all actuality, Abram wasn't, Abram, Sarai, Hagar, they were not striving. Well, yes, they were. <laughs> they were striving for a son. But in the scriptures... That son is Christ. That son testifies of Christ and nothing less. Nothing less. So what then is the worry, Abram? You still don't have a son. You still don't have an heir. Sarai, what troubles you? You still don't. You still not have not brought forth, uh, birthed a son, an heir for Abram? But it's ultimately not about Abram's son. It's not about Sarai being able to birth, conceive a son. It is about the son of the living God. So that got my attention. Ten years and I love this. Ten years this is, this is how, this is the direction they go. And yet the Lord, listen, does not. I'm not even sure the wording because I know it, it'll come up later on. Um, the Lord remains faithful to his son. And he is ever directing our hearts unto his faithfulness, unto his son. So I'll just go ahead and read, <clears throat> excuse me, continue on. I have, a, I have a comment here, and I'll just go ahead and pull it up real quick. I was, I was just kind of meditating on these. Uh, once again, this is a bilingual class, so I did, already did my Spanish class. And it's all right. Be there in just a second. I, I began to think about this passage. It's 
Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Now, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Now, when we are trusting in the Lord with all our heart, the expectation, or shall I say it this way, when we are truly trusting in the Lord with all, all our heart, all of our heart, the full attention of our heart, our expectation is Christ himself, the Son of the living God. When our expectation is something less, we are not trusting in the Lord with all of our heart. Remember? Abram, the Lord, by His Spirit, finally brings Abram in his heart, in understanding, in knowledge, unto where he hath brought his soul in reality, so that Abram can discover the Lord who is ever-present in the land. And from day to day to day, appearing to appearing to appearing, Abram was discovering the mercy of God anew, because it was all based upon what God does, what God can do, and not what man does or what man can do. An heir, if the Lord brings about uh, the term an heir, he's speaking of his son, Christ himself. Nothing less. And yet here they consider themselves they consider something less than Christ. But the Lord does not abandon them. No, no, the Lord does not abandon them. Even when Hagar runs away, even when Hagar makes a decision, decides, considers the situation, calculates the situation, and says, this is a bad situation, that was a good situation, Egypt was a good situation, and that's what's governing her mind, and she runs away, she flees from purpose, the Lord redirects her heart back. Let's see. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and, here's the key word, submit thyself. Submit thyself. And see, here's the thing. Hagar was right there with Abram Sarai. She was in the household of Abram. Thing is, after she conceived, maybe her heart was no longer submissive. Maybe she was no longer submitting to the greater purpose that serves, to the greater purpose that governs the house. So she flees, and yet the angel of the Lord redirects her heart back to purpose. And return and submit thyself. See, we can be we can be born again, but we not we we may not submit ourselves to the purpose that governs the house. Therefore, there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of worry, there's a lot of doubt, there's a lot of confusion because we are considering something other than Christ himself. We consider ourselves and others. We consider man, that's what it amounts to. We consider man. Well, the Lord never told us, consider man. He says, consider Jesus. And all the places I believe in the scriptures, and I haven't looked them up, I haven't looked them up, but when the term consider is found, ultimately it is to consider the Lord. It has to be. Jesus said, they are they that testify of me. 
that direct our heart unto Christ. This is what governs the house of God. Everything, the full attention of the heart placed upon one. And in Him, and in this one, in this Son, to find everything. Everything that was declared of God. To find everything that God spoke to our heart concerning to find everything in the person of His Son. The thing is, we, we want to find everything in ourselves. Abram, Sarai, Hagar, so we consider ourselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. So anyway, the commentary that I wanted to uh, read, and let me just go ahead and read the passage uh, in Genesis chapter 16, verse 7. And the angel of the Lord found her, found Hagar, by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain on the way to Shur, verse 8. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence comest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said, Unto her I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, and it shall be that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the name, and the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And Ishmael is the Lord heard, or the Lord hears. And he will be a wild man. Now here's a description of Ishmael. He will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. <clears throat> now think of this. The description, the description of the heart that is considering something less than Christ. The description of the heart that is considering self. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. There's, <clears throat> there's an unrest, a restlessness. It goes on. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I here looked after him that seeth me? That seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Bir, Bir, Bir Laharoi, behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old, that means he was eighty-six, when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Okay, now I want to I go ahead and read uh, the commentary that grabbed my attention. As I said, I, I think it was like three or four weeks ago when I had actually looked at this, but still, it still catches my attention. Now this, this is when the, the context of this commentary is Genesis chapter 3, 22, where there's uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, and basically Adam and Eve partake of the knowledge of good and evil they considered, shall I say it this way, man, when man first considers something less than Christ, something less than life, something less than the Son. So this is the Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges commentary. And uh, a little fragment of the commentary says this, the Targum of Ankylos to avoid the phrase, this is what they're doing, to avoid the phrase, a man has become as uh, one of us. And let me just go ahead and read that real quick. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. He drove the man out, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Okay, that's the verse. 
verse 22. And so the targum of Onkelos, to avoid the phrase, man has become as one of us, renders it, is become one from himself. Where self now makes the decisions. And, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to admit that when Christ is the object, when Christ is the expectation, that we have to depend and trust upon God. We have to. We have to. Not one of us, us who are born again, not one of us decided at some point in time to be born again. No. That was the Lord. That was the Lord. That was the Lord in His divine, tender mercy and ever-abounding grace when the Lord stepped in, doing what only He can do. From that moment onward, it's still the same. It is still the same. At what, at what moment, at what time do we now begin to, listen, quote unquote, help God? No, we can't. We can't. Well, we, we can do for a lesser expectation we can do for a lesser consideration, but if the object, if the expectation is Christ, we must trust the Lord. And remember, Abram had no clue what he was to discover in the land. He had no clue of even the land itself. Think about it, think about it. How shall what if this was Abram's thought? How shall I know this land? I mean, the Lord calls him, get thee out from, and come unto a land that I will show thee. How is it that I will know that I have, quote unquote, arrived? What determined that the Lord appeared? What determined anything? the Lord appeared. What determined the call? The Lord appeared. What determined Abram taking a new course while he was in Babylon, remember? He was on a course with all the rest of the world, all the rest of the Babylonians. What determined Abram to step out of that and take a new course that was contrary to the course that he was on before? The Lord appeared. Do you see? And what will determine the promised son, the promised heir? The Lord must appear. So in all, in all actuality, when the Lord declares something, He is declaring unto them Christ to birth in their hearts Abram, Sarai, Hagar, an expectation to behold him. The Lord declaring his testimony of his son, which is to cause our hearts to consider, begin to consider him in a, the Lord, in a new way that we may discover the Lord who is ever present in the land anew in a way we have not known before. See, God does not declare anything less than His Son. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 39, 40. They are that you search the scriptures, in them you think you have this, in them you think you have that. The term He actually uses is eternal life. But he could very well have said, in them you think you have righteousness, in them you think you have peace, and, but he used life. In them you think you have eternal life, 
And then Jesus says this, and they are they that testify of me. And you can never have what you read in the scriptures except you find it in coming to me. The Lord speaks to Abram concerning a seed, concerning a son, concerning an heir. Testifying of the seed, testifying of the son, testifying of the heir, so that the heart of Abram may begin to consider him. Begin to consider Christ, who is the true son, the only begotten son of the living God. The risen son of the living God. And therefore, his expectation is now upon him and him to appear, to discover the Lord anew in the land. And that is dependent, once again, upon the Lord. Of course, chapter 16, when we begin to consider something less than Christ, the Son of the living God, the whole purpose for which the scriptures are given of God, when we, can, when we begin to consider something less, then we can actually put our hand to it. But that doesn't change the scriptures. That doesn't change what God hath said. That doesn't change the intent, the purpose of God saying what he hath said. Because the expectation is eternal and the expectation remains. It is the expectation of Christ, the Son of the living God, to discover him. So, going on. The Targum of Onkelos, to avoid the phrase, as one of us, excuse me, renders it, is become one from himself. So, not submitting to the purpose that governs the house, not submitting to the purpose that governs the land. And because of that, considering something less, considering man, considering ourselves, considering me, considering you, considering brother or sister so-and-so, and not considering Jesus. One from himself. So, now, I'm making the decisions based upon what I believe the expectation to be, based upon what I am considering. I am now making the decisions. I am no longer submitted to what governs the house. Do you see? But the Lord remains the same. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Nothing has changed at all. And we find that with the Lord. He remains the same. Okay, this uh, just going on with, uh, that was the Cambridge Bible for Schools and Colleges commentary. Once again, <laughs> sorry, is become one from himself. I think, I think it, I'm not sure if it was the last class or one of the previous classes I mentioned this. Jesus said, except you be as one of these little children, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven or something like that. Let me, forgive me if I misquoted it. Let me see if I can find it. And of course, it wasn't in my notes. That's why I am trying to look it up right now. <laughs> Whoops. 
Oops, that's not it. Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, let me go ahead and jot this down real quick. It's Matthew chapter 18, verse 2. Oh, let's start with verse 1. Now, once again, Jesus is not saying to be a little child. No. Because later on, the Lord declares through the Apostle Paul, once again, to we all come in the unity of the faith unto the knowledge of the Son of God. And yet, how can we come? By the work of another, by the work of the Spirit. And once again, what is the attitude, if you will, of a child? I cannot. I depend upon another not trusting in self, not trusting in one's own ability, but trusting in the ability of another, where mercy is required. One who is all-powerful doing that, what only he can do. For one who is completely, listen, powerless. And that is man. We are completely powerless with no power whatsoever. Yet we believe we have some ability and therefore we use our ability to help God, to listen, serve God's purpose. But God's purpose is not served in our ability, but in His. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Considering themselves. Considering man. Who is, listen to this, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven if it is not the king himself? Consider Jesus. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them, right in the center, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. All right. Whoso, let's just go up to verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But why? because the ability is not mine. The resources is not mine. The confession, not I, but another. And specifically, not I, but Christ. Is become one from himself, This happens automatically when we consider something less than Christ. Because now we need to address the issue. We need to correct, change, bring along the situation. When we consider something less than Christ. When we are, in fact, considering Christ, and this is once again by the work of the Holy Spirit directing the full attention of our heart and placing it upon His God, the one eternal expectation and object of God Himself. Now, when this is happening, 
we cannot, or shall I say, we realize that we cannot add to or take from that which the Lord hath done. The one who is ever present, who fills the land. We are, at that time, our hearts, our hearts are actively at rest. And what does it mean to be at rest? Not I, but Christ. I'm doing nothing. I can't do anything. No, it wasn't my teaching. No, it wasn't my preaching. No, no, it was God. If there was any effectual power in it, it was God. I cannot, but the Lord can. Remember, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. With man, anything of eternal weight or value is impossible, but not with God. So, going on. This is the pulpit commentary for Genesis chapter 16. Uh, this is actually verse 15, where it says, And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. Okay, it says, uh, the God, Thou God seest me, or thou God of vision. The idea is that the sight of God was deliverance. The idea... Uh, once again, this is the pulpit commentary for Genesis chapter 16, 15. The idea is that the sight of God was deliverance. And it is not that, listen, it is not that Hagar saw her deliverance at that moment. No. She was already outside of Egypt. She had already been delivered, if you will, from the bondage of Egypt the moment she entered into the house of Abram. Ah, but the attention of the heart. What was she considering? We have been delivered, my brothers and sisters. This happens at the moment of new birth. The question is, have we seen our deliverance, who Christ himself is? Are we considering Christ himself? Once she saw the Lord, listen, she heard, she saw the Lord, and the impossible was now possible. She was able to submit to that which governed the house. She actively submitted to that which governed the house, whereas before she was not submitting. Though she was in the house, she was there, right up to the point where she considered herself as something great, greater than the Lord of the house greater than the mistress of the house, the woman of the house, Sarai. She considered something other than that which governs the house, Christ himself. She considered her own conception. Do you see what I mean? Do you see how just the chain of events kind of go down, <laughs> you know, ball of fire, <laughs> crash and burn, all because of considering something less than Christ. But thank God, aren't you thankful for the Lord, for God the Father who considers nothing other than His Son? Goes on. Once again, uh, so the, uh, still with the public commentary. So the world was weary, was wearied itself in the wilderness of its own ignorance and moral helplessness. Uh, it has a 
comment to look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 22 through 31. And then it goes on. The unspiritual carnal mind is the bond slave which must give way to the true heir. And it says, all true religious life is a response to revelation. In his light, we see light. Now, with this, with this little uh, fragment here, the little part of the verse, the unspiritual carnal mind is the bond slave which must give way to the true heir. Carnal mind, the strength, ability of man, all that. The only, it says it must give way to the true heir. Yes, indeed it must. But the only what will cause it to give way is when the true heir appears, listen, and is recognized and is made known in the house. Then what is not the true will give way. See. What were they considering? They were considering something less than the true heir who is Christ himself. They were considering something less than Jesus himself. So then this one is now in view. Something less. It doesn't matter what it is, but it's now in view. And I, I believe I've, I've said it before in, in past classes. If I want to know the Father, I must know the Son. If I want to know the peace of God, I must know the Son. If I want to know the love of God, I must know the Son. Nothing less than Christ, brothers and sisters, nothing less than Christ himself. So, when does my concept give way? When the true appears. When does my darkness give way, which is ignorance? When the light appears. When does my walk change course from that which I have always known? When the Lord appears. It's always dependent upon the appearing of the Lord. And not so that it can be so. It is so. No, it is so. The Lord fills the land. The glory of the Lord. Listen. Holy, holy, holy. This is Isaiah. The whole earth is filled with his glory. When is it so? The moment of new birth. The moment the Lord appears, whether the soul, the heart is aware of reality, aware of the one who is present or not. Seeing the Lord, the Lord appearing does not make it. Okay, let me rephrase this. Seeing the Lord who is ever present in the land, God making known his son, revealing his son, making manifest his son, who is ever present in the land, does not make it so at that moment. No, it was so at that moment, at the moment of new birth. But by God making known unto our heart, his son who is ever present in the land, there is a you can say a sigh of relief there is a peace that begins or shall i say this a peace that we begin to submit to because though the rest of god is present the rest the sabbath of god is present we still continue active 
as though it were not, or more specifically, as though he were not. All right, going on. Oh, this is real interesting. Still with the pulpit commentary. Did you know where it says the Lord, uh, uh, the Lord says, and you shall call his name Ishmael? Verse, I believe it's verse 11. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael. This is the first time, <clears throat> excuse me, the first instance of the naming of a child before his birth, before its birth. I just thought that was interesting. All right, going on, it says, uh, to name her, her child Ishmael, when it should be born, part was partly as a memorial to herself of the divine mercy of God. And what was the divine mercy of God? God hears, but for what end? What purpose? Return and submit. God doing what we in and of ourselves cannot do. And then the confession is, thank you, Lord. You have done what I could never have done what I could never have done. It goes on. The best evidence that grace has comforted the human heart is prompt compliance with the will of God. The will of God was to return and submit. Okay. Cedar. Excuse me. This is uh, Strong's dictionary for the term Ishmael. It's Strong's number 3458. It says it's from Strong's number 8085 and Strong's number 410. It basically means God will hear or God hath heard. This is um, John Phillips' commentary for Genesis chapter 16, verse 15. Excuse me, Genesis chapter 16, verse 15. Abram acted in the energy of the flesh, and that which was born of the flesh was flesh Ishmael. And I will say this, when we begin to consider something less than Christ, then it is now our ability, our strength, our mind, our consideration, our... It's man. It is us. It is something less than God himself because we begin to consider something less than Christ. Therefore, like that, uh, the Cambridge Bible commentary mentioned it, we are become one from ourselves. We've actually separated. We've actually uh, not, sub we are no longer submitted to that which governs the house. Though we are in the house, though that which governs the house continues to govern, we are not submitted to it. What governs the house of God? is his son. And I, I just, I will say this. <clears throat> when I was in Bible school and God didn't, I'm not sure if God spoke this to my heart or not. It's just after reading, studying and being in the classes, I just kind of began to think about this. And basically it's true. I mean, you see it play out. Uh, flesh begets flesh. Life begets life. Genesis chapter 16, they were considering something less than Christ himself. They were trying to find what God hath spoken in something less than Christ, the Son of the living God himself. Therefore, the result was something less. Something, in fact, that they themselves could produce. Something that required no miracle of God because man could do it in his own ability, which he did. He proved so. F 
flesh begets flesh. Life begets life. So, anyway, that's just what the Lord's put on my heart uh, for this class. Uh, once again, may we present everything to the Holy Spirit. May we submit to the Holy Spirit. Submit to that which governs the house of God. That the Spirit of God may do in our hearts that which pleases God. That which pleases the Father. And may we consider Jesus. Amen? Amen. The Lord bless you. We'll see you in our next class. Amen.